Would you please take your Bibles and open up with me to the book of Hebrews in chapter 7. My name is uh, Nick Spurgeon. I'm one of the pastors here at Parkside, and it's a privilege to be able to follow along in what have been uh, wonderful sermons uh, in the book of Hebrews from both Mac and John Cameron as they made their way all the way to chapter 6. And this morning, I have the privilege of picking up in chapter 7. We'll look this morning at Hebrews 7 and the first 11 verses, just kind of dipping our toes, so to speak, into verse 11, uh, because it ties some things together for us, but really we'll spend the most of our time in the first uh, 10 verses, but I will read to us from 7-1 all the way to 11. So here's what the writer of the Hebrews says. For this Melchizedek, King of Salem, priests of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, King of Righteousness. And then he is also King of Salem, that is, King of Peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the, case, in the one case, tithes are offered, are received, excuse me, by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attain attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Let's say a, a, a quick prayer and ask for God's help. Our Lord, we approach a character like this and we ask for your grace to help us to see Christ and to see Christ clearly as we have in, in the rest of Hebrews as the one who is better and who is greater. And Lord, we pray that as we behold these things that you might bring them home to our hearts, that in seeing and hearing and understanding by the power of your spirit that we might be changed. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Who is Melchizedek? And why does he even matter? That's really the, the question that sort of looms over us as we come to these first 11 verses here uh, in Hebrews chapter 7. On the one hand, truthfully, we're not too unfamiliar with him as we have seen him mentioned uh, a couple times in the book of Hebrews. We saw him twice a few weeks ago in chapter 5, where in chapter 5, verse 6, we see him mentioned in this quotation from Psalm 110. We saw in chapter 5, verse 10, where the author says that Jesus is designated a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then last week in the verses right above the ones that we're studying this morning, we saw that in connection with our hope as Christians, we find Jesus being a forerunner after the order, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So what's the big deal? There's a lot that we could say. My, my wife and I have a two and a half year old, a very lively two and a half year old, let's just say that. And if you're gonna be her Sunday school teacher after this, I just wanna preemptively apologize. Um, <laughs> 
She's a very, very, very lively two and a half year old. And one of our nightly routines with her is that uh, we have family worship, or at least we try to make it a nightly routine. And typically, this is, is very simple. We, we get her out the bath, and we try to make her really excited uh, to go and do family worship. And most of the time, that backfires on us because she's so excited that she doesn't go to bed. And so we get her out of the bathtub. We go to our bedroom, and we sit on the bed, and we simply read a Bible story. We pray, and we sing a song. Really simple. Now, if you've ever experienced trying to teach a two-year-old the Bible you know it's, it's, it's not easy, right? Most of the time, our little girl is either laying across her mom and I, she's either jumping on the bed while we're trying to tell her about Jesus, not because she's excited, just because she's our daughter. Um, and most of the time, sometimes actually, she tries to read us the Bible story, which is really interesting because somehow Elsa is in the Bible story. I don't know. <laughs> But what we try to do amongst all the chaos during family worship is simply after reading her Bible story, draw out one important detail that we repeat over and over and over and over to her. And then we pray it with her so that she hopefully takes that to bed and hopefully it sinks into her heart. And sometimes it does. Most of the time, well, it doesn't. We, we pray for more fruit for that. But um, most of the sometimes it does. Now, we come to a passage like this in Hebrews 7, and truthfully, just honesty here, we can get overwhelmed by all the details that are involved in making sense of Melchizedek. I experienced that myself this week as you're reading all the literature on Melchizedek, and you go, oh my goodness, what am I even going to say about this guy? But I want you to know that just like with my daughter, all, the, all these details are important, but there actually is one thing that emerges clearly that I want you to take home this morning. That as we look at this passage, Melchizedek serves as both a precursor and pointer to Jesus, who is both our priest and our king who lives forever. Melchizedek serves as a precursor and pointer to Jesus, who is our priest and king who lives forever. And as we work through the passage, what I want to do is just simply draw out applications and implications as to why Jesus holding both those offices are actually relevant for us today. Now, in order to do this, we start where the author starts in the first three verses. And what he does in really, actually, it's these first two and a half verses, is bring us back to where Melchizedek is first mentioned in the scriptures in Genesis 14. Now, in the story of Genesis, this is what is happening when Melchizedek shows up. We're told about these four kings who have gathered together under this one king named Keter Laomer to go and, and wage war, so to speak, on the surrounding villages. Really, it's, it's not war. It's more like they're going on these raids to, ra uh, raids to, to pillage these villages. And as they go out and do these raids, they, they make their way south to the area in which Abraham lives. And eventually, these kings attack the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, and they prevail. And as part of the victory, the kings take possession of the people and the property that belong to the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And included in the midst of those people is Abraham's brother, Lot. And so in response, Abraham kind of bands together a group of guys and goes after these kings in order to get his brother back. And the long and the short of it is that Abraham and his, his little group defeat these kings, take back their possessions, and take back Lot. Now, it's on Abraham's return from the defeat of these kings that we find the event described here in the first two verses of Hebrews 7. Right, Abraham, he returns. The king of Sodom comes out to meet him, and along with him comes this figure who almost seems random, but it's this figure named Melchizedek. Right, we see in verses 1 to 2 the relevant details that the author picks up on. For this Melchizedek, in chapter 7 of Hebrews, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. 
Now, you think about this. We have no mention of this character Melchizedek ever before this instance. In fact, if, if this was a movie, we might see this play on the screen and we kind of think, well, Melchizedek is really just a background actor, so to speak. Somebody who's relatively insignificant to the whole of the story. Right? If, if you keep reading, actually, in the narrative of Genesis and just take out this meeting of Abraham and Melchizedek, in the narrative of Genesis, it almost seems as if you take Melchizedek out and it, it goes on without a hitch. Right? Abraham comes back to meet the king of Sodom and he just continues the conversation with the king of Sodom. It almost seems like you remove him, no big deal. But as you see here in Hebrews... In the mind of the author of Hebrews, this character, who truthfully seems that as quick as he, as he appears, he also disappears, he's not simply a background character. No, but he actually plays a, a key role in the Bible story. You notice in the verses that follow in Hebrews, the author unpacks for us why Melchizedek is important. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, Right, in, the, in the midst of this pagan Canaanite culture, there was a king who ruled with righteousness. He's king of Salem, that is king of peace. By extension of his rule, he, he brought peace. But here's the kicker. Verse three, being without father or mother or genealogy, having, beginning, uh, having neither beginning of life nor end of days, what does he do? He resembles the Son of God as a priest forever. Right, the author of Hebrews sees that, that in this one man, Melchizedek, God has been painting this, this beautiful picture that with each swipe of his brush has been showing us the beauty of the Lord Jesus as being both our king and our priest who exercises both of these offices together. You think about this, never in the life of Israel was there ever anyone who they could say these things about. We saw in our study in 2 Samuel that when Saul tries to take on the role of a priest, what happens? Saul the king, he faces judgment and what happens? His kingdom is stripped from him. And we look at the role of the priest, we see how one priest after another, after they die, they can't hold this office in perpetuity. But in Christ, what do we have? Both priest and king are wed together and his kingdom will never be stripped away and his intercession on our behalf will never cease. Now the implications for this are vast. And, and truthfully, what we need is to actually just let them sit on us and take us into the well of the depths of the beauty of Christ. But I want to just give you a few things to consider just from these three verses. Reading this week on what it means for Christ to be both our priest and our king, I found this, this quote from an author helpful. He says, exalted in heaven, he is both, both king and priest for us, and therefore the one mediator for the whole of our salvation." having offered the sacrifice of his blood shed on the cross for the atonement of our sins, and having won God's help by his intercessory prayers. He also possesses royal power to subdue our hearts, govern his flock, and defend his own people against every enemy. It matters that Christ holds both of these offices together. Right, you think about the picture that this paints for us through the book of Hebrews. Remember what we've said through our study. Hebrews, Hebrews has already spoken of Jesus as a righteous king in the opening chapters of chapter one. That he is the messianic king, the one who by virtue of his unique relationship with the father reigns at God's right hand. But we move into chapter two of Hebrews, what do we see? We also see that this king who rules righteously is bringing peace, how? by bringing th all things into subjection to himself. Chapter two tells us that Jesus has defeated death and sin and Satan. And yet what else? We come to chapter four and chapter five of Hebrews. John showed us a few weeks ago that 
We have in Jesus not only a king in heaven who reigns in strength and in power, but a priest who sympathizes, intercedes for us, and bids us to draw near to God. Right, tying these things together, what do we see about Christ? He's the only one who, in holding the whole of our salvation in the very palm of his hand, is able to give us constantly strength and confidence and never ceasing assurance. Right, brothers and sisters, I want you to see this and I want you to actually believe this. Right, I need this as much as, as you do. I'm preaching this to myself because Jesus is both our priest and our king. It affords us the right to say to ourselves all the time, best of times, worst of times, whatever the time it is, that I have one in heaven who sovereignly rules over every situation, working all things together for the good of my salvation. And also, I have one who sits at the right hand of the Father, who forever intercedes on my behalf, and who will sustain me through every situation. All of that is because Jesus is both our king and our priest, and he holds these offices without end, right? No one will usurp him, no one will, will stop him, and therefore, you know what that means for us? We can commit our souls to him. So what we see here in these first three verses is Melchizedek, this, this obscure figure, <laughs> actually paints for us this picture that serves to give us fresh appreciation for Christ and his work on our behalf as priest and king. But secondly, you see, you notice the author's train of thought. He doesn't just stop there, right? In one to three, he's made the connection for us with king and priest, but now he actually moves forward and zooms in on the priesthood in particular, and he, he sets forward for us this connection between Melchizedek and the Levitical priest. And it's interesting how he does this. If you look through verses four and ten, you see four to ten, you see the author makes his argument based on what took place when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and then Melchizedek blesses him. Right now, if we're reading the story of Genesis and and we're reading it just honestly, we may have potentially read this section before. And we saw the story of Abraham and Melchizedek, and, and we just simply skipped over it. Right after all, uh, there's only three verses given to this, and so we just keep moving on. Right? We read that either Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and if we're weekly churchgoers, we're like, oh, well, well that's nice. And then we, we see Melchizedek bless Abraham, and we say, oh, that's, that's very nice of Melchizedek. Right? And then we just keep on reading in the narrative. But you see what the author does here? It's actually interesting. He actually gives us instruction as a Bible reader. Right? We should read the text of Scripture very carefully and very slowly because what the author of Hebrews sees in this account in Genesis 14 is actually an instance that it has further ramifications for our understanding of Jesus. Right? Notice, notice how his train of, of thought plays out. First, you see verse 4. He turns our attention to see how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his spoils. Now realize what's going on here. This is some 500 years before the institution of the Levitical priest, right? And within the, the institution of the Levitical priest, there was actually a command given that the people of Israel were to give a tithe to the priest in order to sustain them in their work at the temple, but what do we see happening? This is some 500 years even before that command, and what is Melchizedek, what is happening? Abraham is paying tithes to Melchizedek. He's, he's paying homage to him. Verse six, this man who, Melchizedek, who has no connection to Abraham on the basis of his lineage, receives the tithes from Abraham and blesses him, doing what? Showing that he is superior to Abraham. Now, that's a big deal, 
Right? Again, it would be easy to read over the story in Genesis because of the importance of Abraham, and we miss what happens. Right? The father of the nation of Israel, the patriarch, the one who received the promises, is paying tithes to another. Right? Don't miss the significance of this. Abraham, despite how truly great he is, and he is in this instance, is, both, is doing two things. He's recognizing the greatness of Melchizedek and bearing witness to the validity of his priesthood. And by extension, what does that mean? Because the Levites, the priests in Israel, being part of the offspring of Abraham, because they are part of the offspring of Abraham, what does the author say? It's as if they paid tithes to Melchizedek themselves. And what is the author doing? Tying together these things, he's showing the superiority of Melchizedek. Now, I realize that this argument that is made here might seem somewhat convoluted to us, but it wouldn't have to the people to whom the author is speaking to. Right? Place yourself in the story in the biblical story, and think about what the author has just done. He's taken the patriarch of Israel, Abraham, right? This guy who plays a huge role in the life of the people of God. And he takes the Levites, the, the mediators of the Mosaic Covenant, who also play a hugely important role in the people of God, and what does he do? Weaving them together says at, a time, at the time of Abraham, 500 years before the Levitical priest, there was a man who from the very outset was reminding the readers that no matter how great that priesthood was, there was from the very beginning of the story a priestly line that stood above the rest. And what does that mean? Well, in doing this, the Melchizedek lays a foundation for Christ as pointing forward to the one who was going to be the greater priest, who, as we will see, will guarantee a greater hope. Now, I was, as I was thinking about these things this week, I was reminded of a clip of an interview that I recently saw between uh, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, and Mike Tyson. Arguably, some of the greatest boxers to ever live, right? Right? And throughout the interview, they're asked a couple of questions, and, and most of the time, they kind of respond in a sort of self-deprecating way, right? Which is funny with, with all these guys and all the pride that exists between these three guys. <coughs> At one point, for example, uh, the interviewer asked, you know, who hit the hardest? Which one of you would you say hit the hardest? And, you know, um, Ali points to Mike Tyson. And he said, Mike says no, and Mike says no, Ali would have hit the hardest, and, and Ali says, no, 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 I, I was fast, but you know, he acts like he hits himself, and he acts like he falls over, and he says, but Mike was strong. <coughs> but the interesting part of the interview came towards the very end. Right, they're all having kind of this funny interview, they're sitting back very relaxed on a couch, and the interviewer asks really this, this final, kind of like daring question, honestly. He says, out of all three of you, who is the best? Who's the greatest? And unexpectedly, Ali says, he points to Mike. And Mike says, no, 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 time out, right? He gets really serious. He sits up in his seat. And despite how silly they've been throughout the interview, he gets very serious at this point. And he looks and, he's, he, looks and he points to Mike and he says, I know I'm great. I know Sugar Ray is great, but this man, there is a reason that he is called the greatest of all time. Pointing to Ali, he continually says, there's a reason that he is the greatest. Throughout the history of Israel, Abraham, great. The Levitical priest, great. Play crucial roles in redemptive history. Melchizedek, even greater. But what have they been doing? Pointing forward. This man, Jesus, we're great 
but there's truly a reason that he is the greatest. Why does that matter? Why does it matter that Jesus is the great high priest, greater than the Levitical priesthood? Why would that matter for us today? Will you look over in verse 11? If perfection could have been attained by the Levitical priest, there would have been no need for another to arrive. If full salvation could have been secured by the priest of old, there would have been no need for one after the order of Melchizedek. But they couldn't do it. They could not do it. For us, apart from Christ arising in the order of Melchizedek, you and I could never have full assurance of salvation. One of the greatest doctrines, in my opinion, to come out of the 15th and 16th century Reformation isn't simply the rediscovery of the doctrine of justification by faith. It's also the doctrine of the Christian's assurance that we who profess Christ can leave out of here this morning and no matter what happens to us, if we are united to Christ by faith, we can be assured that if we were to die, we would be with him for eternity. You think about that. There's, there's no amount of financial success, no amount of striving for some type of personal fulfillment, no, no relationships, no religious systems that can ever bring you that type of assurance that is found only in Christ and Christ alone. Because what has Christ done as our priest? He has perfectly secured the very pardon that we need in order to stand assured and confident before God. Think about what this would have meant for the readers of Hebrews. You go to chapter 10 and you see the struggles that these people were facing. 1032 and following talks about how they were enduring intense suffering. Some of them were being put in public, out front of everybody, and had to uh, be mocked and scorned for their following Jesus. Some of them had been put in prison. Some of them had, take, had their homes, their property, all of these earthly comforts taken away from them. And you can imagine that the weight of their circumstance as it sits in on them and presses in upon them could cause them to loosen their grip on Jesus. Right after all, the, the political situation at that time would have said this, if, if you just come back to, the, to, the, to the, the rhythms of religion in the temple, we will we'll stop all this stuff. And the author of Hebrews says here, listen, if, if you let go of Jesus, you let go of the only one who can assure you that you will stand righteous before God. There's a wonderful part in an older video that was on the life of Martin Luther, the reformer. And as they're walking through the church and then into, into the vestry, the Luther and his superior monk are having a, a conversation. And they're talking about all these things that are going on in Luther's theology, right? They, they show the, the clip of, of Luther and this monk standing before one of the icons, and they begin to argue about the role of an icon. They begin walking some more, and they talk about um, things like indulgences and the, the, the role of the mass and so on and so forth. And there's this great scene where after uh, Luther has just described, as some of us are probably aware, his, his awakening where he's studying the book of Romans and he reads that sentence that the just shall live by faith and he says it's like heaven opened up to me itself. And as he's describing that, the other monk looks to him and says, Dr. Martin, 
if you strip all of these things away, they're these people's visible supports, he calls them. Talking about the icons and the mass and all these different things. If you, if you strip that away from them, what will you put in their place? And Luther, I love this. Luther responds with one word, Christ. Strip everything away. What will you put in their place? Christ. Why? Because man only needs Christ, says Luther. But at the end of the day, we will not find our assurance based in anything else. Right? We have to look upward and see him there who put an end to all our sins. Our security, our assurance as Christians is found only in the one Jesus Christ. Right? For every doubt of your assurance that you have, Christ in both his office as priest and king can answer every doubt. If you feel overwhelmed and burdened by your sins, trust that Christ has made true, full atonement for them. If we feel tired, overwhelmed by the situations that life throws at us, we turn to Christ as the one who says, come to me. I'm in heaven interceding for you and I will give you grace. If we're tired of fighting for some semblance of assurance, we turn to Christ as the one who guarantees our eternal salvation and we stake the whole of our life upon him. Because he is the righteous king, the eternal priest, who can by virtue of his very, very character and office, he is able to grant you this eternal assurance of hope. Friends, Melchizedek here, as we approach a passage like this, Melchizedek really sets the tone for everything that is gonna go from here on out by being a precursor and pointer to the offices of Christ. The author is gonna take us in the weeks to come through a series of arguments that are not just meant to build our heads, but are meant to drive us deeper and deeper into finding Christ as truly the only comfort, both in life and in death. Right, may that be the case for us this morning, and as we continue, Lord willing, may God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, you are so good to remind us this morning of the Lord Christ as both our king and our priest. Lord, we think about the implications of our lives and we pray that we might walk out of here this morning with a fresh sense of how truly great Jesus is. That we would cast all our anxieties upon him, knowing that he is the one who cares for us and can care for us. And we pray, Lord, that we would continue to grow in our assurance as we sink deeper and deeper into who Christ is. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.